Hi, this is Jason Baxter, author of A Beginner's Guide to Dante's Divine Comedy. You're listening to Pints with Jack. I can only confess to being repeatedly humbled and reconverted by Lewis in a way that is true of few other modern writers. Rowan Williams in The Lion's World. Well, this is Pints with Jack, Season 6, Episode 42, The Lion's World, After Hours with the Most Reverend Rowan Williams. Welcome, everyone. Here on Pints with Jack, we're reading our way through the works of C.S. Lewis. And this is an episode recorded in part um, for Narnia Month, and so we're delighted to be joined by Rowan Williams. Our merriment, Lewis says in Weight of Glory, exists between people who have, from the outset, taken each other seriously. Rowan Williams pays Lewis, and in his book The Lion's World, Narnia in particular, the crucial compliment of taking him seriously. And in so doing, Williams helps us to take God more seriously and offers deep insights into what it means to be humans, to be Christians, and to be disciples. What a welcome event. Well, today I'm joined by Rowan Williams. He was the 104th Archbishop of Canterbury, the author of dozens of books. Williams is rightly considered one of the preeminent Christian theologians of our century. And of particular interest to our listeners, Williams is a longtime devotee to the works of the Inklings, and in particular, C.S. Lewis. Before he retired, he was master of Maudlin College, Cambridge, Lewis's old college, and that is where I met him 10 years ago during the celebration of Lewis's 50th anniversary of his passing. It's a great honor and a personal pleasure to have him with us. Welcome, Rowan Williams. Thank you so much, Andrew. It's a real joy to be with you. A real privilege. Thank you. Well, here on Pints with Jack, we uh, we take a, a book every every year, and this year we've been discussing Out of the Silent Planet. But we've found that our listeners are so devoted to Narnia that um, that we take a Narnia month every year. And one of the highlights, um, and we all play second fiddle to that, is when Kristen comes in and talks about her own uh, work on Narnia. So the listeners call me Lazo Minor and her Lazo Major, but you know what it's like to be uh, to to have married up. Absolutely. <laughs> and how have you been keeping? How are things going for you? Pretty good, thank you. Pretty busy still. We, uh, Of course, we have a new grandson to uh, obsess about, which is wonderful. Yes. He'll be two very shortly. Wonderful. Yes, looking forward to some time with him in the summer. Oh, good. Well, um, we generally, in Pints with Jack, and I think I may have even given you some Pints with Jack, a Pints with Jack glass when you visited. Uh, last year in in, um, in Alexandria. We generally have a little something to drink. Do you have uh, something that you're drinking today? I have a little glass here. Ah, good. And what are you drinking? Well, I'm afraid Lewis would be very disappointed in me. It's wine rather than beer. <laughs> That's what I quite enjoy at this time of day. Ah, so Excellent. Well, and I've got a not a pint of bitter, please, but a pint of Boddington's. Perfect. Cheers. Cheers. I was so taken aback by looking again at uh, at your book, The Lion's World. And so, I've got a few questions about that and some some questions in general. So, if you don't mind, I'd love to, love to jump in. Um, when this episode airs, we'll be in the middle of our annual Narnia month. For those uh, unfamiliar with your book with, and its exploration of the Chronicles, could you tell us a little bit more about The Lion's World? Hmm. I've been reading Narnia, of course, for decades and decades and noticed how often I was going back to it for sermon illustrations and even for reference and illumination in rather more heavyweight theological writing. Mm. And I think it was around the time that the, the new films were being made first. I thought, let's try and pull some of this together. And originally what I proposed was a short series of talks in Canterbury Cathedral when I was Archbishop on Narnia and what a theologian might have to say about Narnia. So Yes, aimed at a general audience who knew a bit about Lewis, a bit about Narnia, perhaps, but not very much. Perhaps also people who knew a bit about Christianity, but not very much. Mm -hmm. So that's how it started. And it helped me really focus on those, those things which did drive me back again and again to quoting Lewis. Not just the vision of God, but the vision of humanity that Lewis lays out, because I've always believed that those two belong absolutely together, mm -hmm. and that the greatest gift we have from rightly thinking about God 
is rightly thinking about ourselves and our neighbors too. You know, I've been thinking about this. I even preached about it last Sunday. I think the phrase, and the second is like unto it, right? Absolutely. The, the two commandments work interchangeably, I think. That's right. And there's a wonderful saying by an early Christian writer, if you can show me what you mean by a human being, I will know what you mean by God. Wow. Who said that? I think it's um, Athenagoras in the second century, not terribly well-known Greek writer, but it's quite something, isn't it? Mm, absolutely. You see what someone thinks about a human being, you understand what they mean by God, and ideally vice versa, of course. And I think that's part of the reason why Lewis is such a helpful teacher for me anyway, is that it's not only his thinking, but the way that he treated people. You know, it was just remarkable, wasn't it? That's right. That's utterly remarkable. I remember when Humphrey Carpenter wrote his book on the Inklings years and years ago, mm -hmm. one of the reviews, I think by Philip Toynbee, unusual sort of figure, very uh, eccentric, left-wing, agnostic writer who came to faith rather late in life. He said reviewing that book that one of the things that he took away was that of all the Inklings, he thought Lewis was the most simply converted personality, mm. the one who kept on trying to realize basic Christian charity in all his dealings. And that, you know, that was an unsought testimonial, really, from somebody who had no, no skin in the game at that time. Mm -hmm. I think it reflects back on Walter's comment that Lewis was the most thoroughly converted man, right? Exactly. Exactly. And then in your own book, you talk about being continually reconverted um, by Lewis. Can you say a little bit more about that? I thought that was fascinating. Lewis himself says somewhere that it's good to have a book that's what he called a mouthwash for the imagination. Mm -hmm. You know, just take a deep gulp, swill it around, and get the stale taste out of your mouth. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's what I sense when I read his books. I think, oh, now this is why it matters. This is why Christian faith is what it is in our lives. Mm -hmm. And he makes it fresh. Mm -hmm. And I, I've never failed to find something of that freshness, that mouthwash quality when I turn back to him, so that I think I'd forgotten, but yes, this is what it's about. And again, in, in his letters, he writes somewhere about those times when doctrines that you thought you understood or were familiar with suddenly come to blossom for you. Mm -hmm. and that's a, it's a wonderful picture of the things you take for granted rumbling along in the background of your mind, yeah. and then give it a bit of space, and suddenly they come alive, and you think, oh, yes. Yes, of course. Yes, of course. <laughs> that's it. That's what it's about. Well, and that's such a gift and a guide. I, I wonder how much of that has to do with his incredible memory, right? Because everything, the conversations were always going on inside his head, yeah? I think so, yes. And if you, if you read him, you see him conversing in a way with everybody from scriptural writers through St. Augustine and Richard Hooker and Thomas Aquinas, um, Bishop Butler. Mm -hmm. Some of his contemporary critics, Chaucer and Shakespeare, you know, he's always engaging with that great rich mainstream, not simply of Christian culture, but of, yeah. I suppose, European culture itself. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I think that one of the things that helps make him a redoubtable thinker is that the Christian conversion came late, you know, halfway through his life and after his most of his intellectual training anyway um, was done, his development continued. Um, and of course, there's that remarkable anecdote about being in Lewis's rooms and him pulling a book off the shelf and reading a line and, and or the student reading a line and Lewis quoting the rest of the page. Yes. yes. So, that's incredible. I also think about the anecdote, I think it's Warney who records it, of Lewis um, coming in from a walk and relating that on his way, he saw a farmer lying by the edge of his field. And Lewis jumps up and says, oh, I've committed a sin against charity. And he goes out and he gets the farmer and brings it back in and refreshes him, you know, and sends him on his way. And it's that kind of refreshment, but I think that he's also refreshing himself. And then that, that mar remarkable letter in the 50s where he says, I believe I've finally forgiven my former headmaster after decades of trying. And that's so powerful because it says two things. It says forgiveness is absolutely real and forgiveness is unbelievably difficult. Mm. We need to know those things with equal weight, I think. Yeah. It's it's real and it's important because it's hard. Mm -hmm. The hardness tells us just how big a step this is, just how miraculous a thing forgiveness is. And I can't remember who it was who said when challenged on what the um, the most 
difficult proposition of the Apostles' Creed was, but they said, I believe in the forgiveness of sins is the hardest proposition oh, to believe. Yeah. And for me, that line that makes me a liar every time I say it, um, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who… Yes, yes. Well, and uh, I think that it's that kind of humility that allows him to answer all of those letters and do it, you know, carrying himself so lightly like Chester to one say of the angels. It's amazing. It's yeah. Amazing. You know, I was just, I can't recommend your book uh, highly enough. I just, even 12 years after, 11, 12 years after its publication, still really speaking um, clearly. And one of the things that struck me this time, I think that you encourage us to read Narnia as stories first and then allow the theological implications to arise kind of organically from situations and characters. Is that a helpful approach that we can apply elsewhere? And if so, how should we do that? How do we read culture differently and then with an eye to theology? It's a very good question and not, not easy to answer, but I suppose what was in my mind when I wrote that was, don't start by asking, what's the message I've got to distill from these stories? Mm -hmm. Let them unfold because if with Lewis we believe that there is uh, some dimension of God's action, some dimension of God's agency always there ahead of us, mm -hmm. then the pattern, the grain of the wood that we feel under our hands will be the same. And we read, therefore, not looking for a message, but looking for a, a reality, a sort of urging towards the surface, towards the light. Mm. And I think that's, that's something I, I take then to reading other bits of fiction and drama and so forth, and asking, where is this turning towards the light? Mm. And that may be not necessarily a happy ending or a reward for virtue, but where in these characters in this situation do we see a kind of inner pressure towards the longing for release that the gospel speaks of? Yeah. Not that you know, the gospel simply yeah. comes in as a happy answer to all our problems. Mm -hmm. But that if we're serious about our doctrine of creation, there's always going to be something urging towards mm -hmm. that peace. Uh, Augustine, whom I always quote, as you know, obsessively, Augustine says somewhere that the world just constantly seeks balance. Look around you, the world is always trying to balance itself out. Mm -hmm. Even if you hang something upside down or hang somebody upside down, if you hang somebody up by their feet, the inner organs find their balance. Somehow, mm -hmm. the world is a system of balance seeking, mm. and something of that comes through. I think in that idea that as we run our hands over the world, the grain of the world, the surface of the world, mm. what we will find is that longing for balance, that longing for order, that longing, therefore, for reconciliation and homecoming. Mm -hmm. And I suppose that connects a bit, doesn't it, with Lewis's very eloquent stuff about joy and the, the longing for joy and the, the sort of intense homesickness for a home where we've never lived. Yes, yes. It's uh, Odyssean, I think, to some degree. But then also in Mere Christianity, he says, um, I believe that, that the gospel is the greatest comfort, but it doesn't begin in comfort, it begins in despair. Exactly. And in some ways, I think the fallenness of the world is the grain of it. I mean, the lectionary has been talking about the groaning, right, uh, these last couple of weeks. That's right. And that sense of, of something amiss, something so, you know, <laughs> to, to misquote Wordsworth, far less deeply interfused. Interfused, yes. Yep. That's, that's helpful, I think, because in a way, it makes me think of that massively different Christian writer Flannery O'Connor, mm -hmm. who you know, always wants us to to look right into the heart of what goes wrong, mm -hmm. so that we may see the scale and the depth of what it might mean for things to go right. Yes. Only when we know how deep the wounds are do we know what it is to be healed. Right, and to feel those honestly, yes. and to you know to look about for recourse, and to to respond to that that deep seated human urge. It's not a Christian urge or it's a Christian urge because it's the human urge, I think, from the fall, that something is not right, that we're not home. 
Yes, Cardinal Newman talking about the great Aboriginal catastrophe. <laughs> we will sense at some level. Yeah, T Bone Burnett, uh, the the producer, has done some brilliant work. Says that as a Christian, you can either write about the light or what you see by the light. Mm. And in some ways, I think Narnia is that. But I think that I would go him one step further and say that one of the things that Christians are preeminently prepared to do is to write about the darkness. Yes. yes. We know the shape of the darkness, but we also know, unlike some of the despairing media and TV shows and whatever that we read in our age, that there's a limit to it. Yes. That someday, like like the borderlands of hell, which is, which are a grain of sand in the great divorce, like Lewis said, God and his mercy made the fixed bonds of hell. That there's only so much that darkness can do and the end of it is not in darkness. But um, even in speaking about the darkness together, uh, a sort of kind of hope can emerge. That's right. That's right. Because one of the things that faith gives, surely, is, is courage, intellectual and imaginative mm. courage. And I think one of the worst things that we can do as Christians is somehow to give the impression that we're too nervous to look at the world for what it is. Mm -hmm. That we shy away from things being complicated, we shy away from things being risky. Mm -hmm. We talk as though belief in God were just hmm, circumscribing and fortifying a safe place. Mm. And of course, that's what the dwarves do at the end of Narnia, isn't it? Yes. They fortify what they think is a safe place. That's right. the opposite of faith. Right, right. Well, and they turn towards themselves, right? They turn towards themselves. The circle faces inwards. Uh, I gave a talk once at MythCon in, I think, 2016. Um, about the last battle until we have faces and how that same kind of inward looking, you know. And for the record, it took me this long to talk about till we have faces. Our listeners will be shocked. Uh, David and Matt usually take a drink as soon as I mention till we have faces. But that, that turning from outward, um, and turning towards self and, and that's the quick road to despair, right? That's right. That's right. And the quick road to a kind of addiction to untruth, which mm. is what, what the end of um, Narnia with the dwarves is about. It's, um, it's what the great divorce is about. It's addiction to untruth. The untruth that you know really is untruth because you can control it, whereas you can't control the real truth. Mm -hmm. The truth is out there, to coin a phrase. <laughs> the <Yeah>. real truth <laughs> is, is not what we concoct and organize for ourselves. Mm -hmm. It's that, that reality which breaks us open and pushes us into a an utterly different landscape, mm, mm. which is also the landscape we've known all along, only we didn't know we knew. Right, right. Narnia and England is, you know, <laughs> which is yes. my definition of heaven. Um, and it's yes. the animals at the end of the last battle who echo what Orwall says at the end, you know, long did I hate you, long did I fear you. I might, yes. and I believe she says, love you. And the animals look at Aslan with hatred or fear, which is self-centered untruth. They're creating an idol and they yes. lose their sentience and off to the left they go. But those who look at Aslan with love. And I think I've been thinking a, a lot about Kate Sonderegger's work, um, recent work on idolatry mm. and wondering if we're not flipping idolatry in our own age, where instead of creating something divine and beautiful so that we can worship, we are alienating the other and creating something ugly and irascible so yeah. that we can hate it. But it's equally yes. empty, you know, and equally self-centered. Equally self-centered, yes, because very often these days people think they, they'll get to know who they are by being absolutely clear about who they're not. Mm -hmm. And that's not a brilliant way <laughs> in. It's, it's like the joke we, we tell in Wales about the, the Welshman who is marooned on a desert island. And when he's finally rescued, they discover he's built two Methodist chapels. Mm-hmm. Why two, they say. Well, he says, that's the one I belong to, and that's the one I wouldn't be seen dead in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, But even in pushing back, and in some of my work on Till We Have Faces, and looking at Lewis and Tolkien within the categories of literary modernism, in the same way that the modernists reject romanticism, but in rejecting, it's a definitional moment that includes romanticism, yes. necessarily. Yes. So too, in rejecting some aspects of modernist literature, Lewis and Tolkien, I think, are imbibing it and then suggesting a way out of that kind of despair where the eagles come and where Orwell is a beloved prince among all the worlds. That's right. That's right. A little bit of hope. 
in your conclusion, I, I'd love to hear you say more about this. You point out kind of your three overarching themes, and I, I hope that I've kind of picked them up well. You talk about a redefinition of transcendence, a recognition, redemptively despairing recognition of, of ourselves as the rebels. And then all of this leads to a reappropriation of God's joyfully invasive grace. Did I catch that right? What, say more about that, and how are those still helpful today? And willingly say a bit more about that. It connects a bit with what I, I said at one point in the book about the wildness of Aslan. Mm -hmm. um, is he safe? Of course he's not safe, but he's good. And the, the sense of this wildness, which doesn't simply operate within our, our usual categories, mm -hmm. so that we, we somehow have to, to go beyond those categories of tame and predictable mm -hmm. ideas in order for God to get hold of us. I think I said that that's, that's why it's so bold and so effective to have the divine portrayed in animal form. Mm -hmm. You know, here is something which does, doesn't work the way we do. Mm -hmm. Wittgenstein in his philosophy says famously, if a lion could talk, we would not be able to understand him, mm -hmm. which is a great philosophical conundrum. <laughs> here indeed we have a lion talking. And we can and we can't understand. We we have enough in common to to keep us moving and exploring. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, we know that it's it's always going to be a world, a landscape, a horizon beyond where we are. So transcendence in that sense of kind of wildness. Mm -hmm. And because of that, um, I think what one of the things I was trying to get at in in the book was that one of the effective things, not only in the land of which and the wardrobe, but elsewhere perhaps in the last battle too, is this notion of faith itself as a kind of rebellion. Mm. We, we rebel against truth all along the way. Okay, so what we need now is a, another kind of rebellion, a rebellion against the tyranny of untruth. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very effective that instead of faith being what you might call the establishment you rebel against, faith is the rebellion against the establishment. Yes. It's the rebellion against the established order mm -hmm. of idleness and untruthfulness and selfishness and evasiveness and all the rest of it. And just emotionally, that gives it a very different flavor. Mm -hmm. You know, faith becomes something challenging, something bold, something mm -hmm. counterintuitive. And the, the notion of you know, Aslan's return in the land of Witch and the Wardrobe being something you you kind of whisper mouth to mouth, he's on the way, he's on the move. Yes. That's that's a, a wonderful picture of of how faith ought to feel in a sort mm -hmm. of tired, cynical world. Mm -hmm. The sort of whispers going around saying, you know what? This is on its way out. This stuff. <laughs> and something else is on its way in. And that something mm -hmm. else is what I call that invasive joy, mm -hmm. um, which is overwhelming and intoxicating. And, well, for good English children like... Um, the subjects of the Narnia books, a bit embarrassing, even. Mm -hmm. you just got to get rid of your embarrassment. Mm -hmm. Always a good message for um, Anglophone or Anglo-Saxon Christians. Sure. Speaking as a non-Anglo-Saxon myself, of course. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I love that. Faith, uh, faith is rebellion versus the tyranny of untruth and, and his kind of invitation. And some of that in my own work, as you've heard before, I look at the opposite of love as not being hatred, but pride, right? Yes, yes. And the opposite of self is going out of ourselves towards the other, as Lewis said in his, in his four loves. And, and that's part of why I love till we have faces because it embodies it. But as you point out in the book, the great divorce suggests it, Narnia suggests it, and this kind of invitation to get out of ourselves, even through the very negative. I've been struck lately by the conversations that Nick Cave has been having with you and with the Archbishop about kind of riding the coattails of grief back into the church, you know, but even that's an invitation, you know, yeah. to, to, to see things really. You know, one of the things that struck me, struck me really forcefully talking to Nick about this was the way in which he, he said after the terrible, tragic death of his teenage son, mm -hmm. His, his sense was of rebellion, not against God, but against, against taking it all for granted. Mm -hmm. He said he was determined to rebel against the idea that he had to be trapped and defined by grief. Mm -hmm. Now, that's, that's quite a Lewisian insight, I think. 
Yes. And of course, grief came late to him, but also quite early and his grappling with that. And I think that that's one of the great gifts of Joy Davidman is that, you know, in her marvelous poetry, when she calls him the great Antarctica or the new found land of woman killing frost and how she was able to wheedle her warm fingers past the icy adolescence that had frozen in him and the piety that had become too easy and to, to grab his heart in a way that Ruth Pitter couldn't have done and nobody else could have done and to kind of bring him fully out. And then he remarks to Coghill, you know, the happiness in his 60s. That had evaded him in his twenties. Yes, that's, so, <laughs> yes. that's beautiful. Yeah, that's beautiful. And the proleptic nature of the springing, the melting of Narnia, the unstoning of all the statues, and then it's fulfilled in his own life. That's right. That's yeah. right. And I remember reading that remark to Coghill. I think when I was mm -hmm. a student, and thinking very poignant. Yes. Yeah. Even at that time when I knew relatively little about the, the yeah. life story. Yeah. You mentioned something about the um, the grain of the world, and and I want to hear more mm. too about the joyfully invasive grace, if you have more to say. But also, I love how you how you portray the inanimate, the dryads, the animals as part of this kind of organic whole. Right before we started speaking, I was talking to my friend Father Pete Nunnally in Virginia, who's doing wilderness church. And surprisingly has found Lewis creeping in. So we've had some productive conversations about yes, that. Yes. And that kind of integration or unity of all creation. Um, and I'd love to hear more about that. Mm. No, I, I think you you put your finger on it. It's um, it's a major strand in him that to see oneself as a creature of God, as a human being, mm -hmm. is to see oneself in the context of a world that's more than just human. Mm -hmm. And I think the talking animals in Narnia are, are one way of opening our eyes to that. What if the rest of the world really were speaking to us? Mm -hmm. Because in fact, if, if we believe that the word of God made all things, the word of God is echoed in all things, mm -hmm. and the world around us does speak in some quite serious sense to us. So I think he's, he's pushing us in that direction and pushing us towards, again, a very Augustinian acceptance of our down-to-earthness. Mm -hmm. We don't get reconciled to God by forgetting or transcending our humanity, but by inhabiting it more and more deeply. And that means mm -hmm. inhabiting the physical world we're in more and more deeply, mm -hmm. and attending with deeper and deeper love and imagination to that material world in, in which we stand and of which we are a part. Yeah. And what is so fascinating for me in a lot of Lewis is that themes which we were, I think, treating as you know, theological novelties perhaps in the 1970s and 80s, Lewis was already turning over in his work in the, in the 40s. Yeah. And notably, I think, in some aspects of the, the science fiction trilogy, mm -hmm. you have a very carefully thought through critique of certain kinds of attitudes, certain kinds of instrumentalist attitude mm -hmm. to the world around. Mm -hmm. You can tell a villain in those books by the degree to which he, and it's usually a he, mm -hmm. is prepared to override the constraints of the material world yeah, and to treat it as just a kind of um, Walmart of cheap goods. <laughs> he, no, he's already anticipating controversies about transhumanism and posthumanism, isn't he? Yes, absolutely. And I think De Descriptione Temporum is an often overlooked um, but incredibly prescient uh, address. We haven't gotten to the depth of him uh, at all. And then the idea of creation where he – and experiment and criticism, I think his later work uh, often. And I must see with other eyes and gladly would I, you know, have all the olfactory uh, information presented to a dog or a bee, right? Um, but also this kind of brotherhood. And that's why I was, I was glad that you mentioned King Frank. And I'm sure I'm not the first one to have this insight. I, I probably am just lazy about my reading. But I think that King Frank is King Frank because he recognizes, like St. Francis, the familyness of all creation, especially, you know, the beasts. Yes, yes. And then Helen, who brings up all of that lovely stuff. And of course, one of Lewis's late and unfinished books after 10 years or, you know, Menelaus Golden Hair. And, and of course, Helen came marching into his life, right? Um, and I think that that's part of what she did was bring him even more fully into the human. 
but that was the trajectory that he was on. Yes, that's right. We've wrapped up um, talking about uh, Out of the Sight of the Planet this season. One of the debates we've had, and Matt just posted on our, our group text, a talk by Jerry Root about the unfallenness of both Paralandra and Out of the Silent Planet. And we've been arguing on the podcast, frankly, arguing, not quarreling, um, about about the fallenness of Malachandra and whether or not it was fallen and, you know, in what sense. And just wonder um, if you have thoughts about Out of the Silent Planet in particular or that thought in general or anything you want to share. I, yes. I, I suspect it is unfallen, but it's that's not the question he's answering there as he's trying to answer it in, in Paralandra. So, right. you know, you don't necessarily look for the same, the same cues. I think possibly he hadn't even phrased the question like that, but... Mm -hmm. What he is doing, I think, there is saying, here is a world whose whose goodness and whose interconnection and interdependence is is somehow established. It's not that people are never stupid or even selfish on this planet, but somehow they're held in a creative interdependence. They're not at odds with other elements of their own world, mm -hmm. some very important level. So even if they're not saints, so to speak, they are perhaps going through what might have been the case in our world were we not fallen. That is, mm -hmm. feeling their way towards a fuller and fuller mm -hmm. level of interdependence in which bestowing the life of God upon each other by charity and gratitude, mm -hmm. where that would steadily open up. Whereas in our world, the great interruption was where we stopped thinking in terms of charity and gratitude and thought in terms of gratification instead. Yeah. So I think Alacandra is perhaps a world which, while not perfect, is still growing without catastrophe. Mm. And part of part of the force of that picture of Malacandra is precisely the the interdependence, the joyful grateful interdependence of different kinds of life, different kinds of intelligent life, mm -hmm. where people don't have to reduce it all to who's on top, which form of life is, is dominant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in the most positive and benign sense, people know their place. Mm -hmm. Not knowing their place so that they cower before the powerful, but knowing how they fit, mm -hmm. knowing that you know, other species do things well and sometimes better than, than our own. On the way to Augres, or maybe it's there, I forget particularly, but where all three species are there and they're laughing. That's right, yes. And, you know, a Ransom can't understand they're laughing, but this sense that there's a commonality. I wonder if it's growing old. Well, we know Malachandra is growing old, but I think it's growing old in a similar way to the, maybe the end of the Age of the Elves, right? But it's not groaning, right? Our creation groans and and I suggested on the podcast, if it's fallen, it's not fallen in the same way that Thulchandra is fallen, right? I think that's the point. I yeah. think that's the point, yes. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's mortal. It's mortal. Yes. And that's all right. <laughs> well, it must be because we share it with our Lord, right? Precisely. Do you really want to get out of those troubles, right? And, and so often in my pastoral work, um, it's the, often time to remind that in this suffering we share – with our Lord um, and our elder brother in the in the fallenness of this world, um, That's right. and what I want to evade, what what he wasn't able. When did you first read Out of the Silent Planet, and how did it how did it strike you? Oh, um, I think probably when I was an undergraduate. Yes, I think so. And part of what struck me was that vivid imagining of mm -hmm. another kind of life. I remember. Um, Oh dear, it's, it's one of the essays in that little book called Light on C.S. Lewis. Yes. Which I remember reading as a student, um, where one of the writers, and I can't remember who it was now, says that Lewis is imagining of the physical contact with another kind of species, another totally different kind of species. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like Dante imagining, what is it, his flight on a griffin or something mm -hmm. in the course of Divine Comedy. I thought at the time that's you know that's high praise, but I, I can see what that means. This really kind of granular and careful imagining mm -hmm. of a completely different kind of sentient life. Mm -hmm. I was struck by that, and then of course I was struck, and I still am, 
by the utterly brilliant scene where Weston is trying to explain his philosophy. <laughs> and he hasn't got the vocabulary for it. And Ransom puts it into plain words. Yes. Um, you know, Weston's kind of sub H.G. Wells rhetoric mm-hmm. translated into plain English. You know, we, mm-hmm. we have the right to kill you because you're not as clever as we are. <laughs> sort yeah. Of, yeah. Sort of thing. It's, I, th- I think that's a, a passage that any student of English language mm-hmm. and literature some, somehow ought to be digesting. Mm. To understand how rhetoric works and how rhetoric cloaks things and the importance, not of avoiding rhetoric, but of knowing what you're doing and knowing some of the you know the, the power mechanics that reside within it. When when I got round to reading Plato's Phaedrus, mm-hmm. which is really all about language and power, mm-hmm. I thought Lewis read that he knew mm-hmm. what he was talking about there, and he's mm-hmm. he's doing a kind of uh, Platonic summary in a way of what Socrates in the Phaedrus is driving against, which is the idea that rhetoric is entirely about the justification of power. Mm. Mm-hmm. And once again, going back to this question of truth, that of course completely brackets issues of truth. Mm-hmm. And the importance of that great scene in Out of the Silent Planet is that Ransom is taking carefully taking apart the rhetoric of power, it's like this is what it boils down to. It's a naked assertion of privilege. Mm-hmm. That's all there is to it. Mm-hmm. It's not transparency to reality. It's transparency to bare will to power, the lust for power. That's all it is. Yeah. By and by, men will try, right, tell his poetry about about the, the tragedy and his arguments with Arthur C. Clarke and the British Interplanetary Society. And even there, I think we see this kind of essential humility. And then I, I love what you said about language. And that's part of what I've been working on, even as I think past my book on just on Till We Have Faces. One of the great implications, I think, is how we tell our story yes. and how we see our story. And Orwell sets out to write this story, but it's this, you know, short little babbling of a dozen words or whatever at the end. But even in her, the writing was, um, the writing was the answer, right? The gods used my pen to probe my own wounds. Yes, yes. And as Lewis, as you were there when I talked to the Oxford Lewis Society, he's trying again and again and again to tell his own story. And I think that that's a good in- invitation. And as we tell our stories, hopefully God comes in yes. right, to those again yes. and again. Yes, that's right. I, th- I think the notion that you in some sense, you invite the healing of God by trying, simply trying to talk truthfully about yourself. Mm-hmm. That comes through again and again, doesn't it? It's when, like Peter in the Narnia stories, when he's confronted by Aslan, it's when he says, mm-hmm. honestly, this is what happened, mm-hmm. that the door is open. Right, right. I always think there of a letter I had from a, a dear friend of mine in her in her last months of life, when she was hmm. finally coming to, to a faith that she had not previously opened herself to, and writing out of the middle of a, a night of pain and wakefulness, and saying, hmm. I want to know how to pray in, in the middle of all this, and by the end of the letter saying, actually, I think I now do. So, you know, hmm. <laughs> ignore the rest of this letter, I've, you know, I've, I've, got there. <laughs> I've got there, just by getting it out there. Well, well done you for being the kind of ear where somebody could come and, you know, and find her way to that, even by untangling it with her own pen. In even in my young pastorate, I'm I'm understanding more and more the importance of just shutting up and and letting somebody speak. Here's some tea. Here's a biscuit, you know, and having no having complete interruptibility yes, and yes. and willingness to hear. Essential. Essential. Because there you, you, you make the space into which someone can, can move and grow. And that's a tiny, tiny sliver of reflection of how God makes the space into which we can all move and grow. Mm-hmm. The God who, as Austin Farrer, who is his great friend, put it, the God who sort of sweeps back his robes to make, make a space where you can stand in front of him. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, and the end of The Four Loves, where Lewis says, if I haven't 
talked about the presence of God, I've at least talked about the absence of God, the, the shape of that hole where our love of God ought to be. It is not enough, it is something, right? To even describe the limits of our own emptiness. Yes, yes. You know, and he says, this is I think brilliant, one of his last books, where a better book would begin, mine must end. We've got our end of the year feedback from our um, from our listeners, and they're heartily tired of me debating with Matt and David about the great divorce versus till we have faces. <laughs> so they're like, "Yeah, okay, we got it done." But um, where do you place? And you mentioned some of this in your book. And where do you see till we have faces on the continuum and its relationship to to a great divorce and out of the silent planet and and other things? We've been talking a bit about that. Oh yes, well. Like you, I think, till we have faces is is Lewis's supreme achievement mm. in all kinds of ways, supreme imaginative achievement, and its mm -hmm. its courage and its range still strike me as utterly extraordinary. Mm. Nothing really prepares you for it quite, and yet when you read it, you can also see all the things that have prepared for it in mm -hmm. the book. And it seems to me that one of the themes which which is there most forcefully until we have faces is precisely what the great divorce is about. Mm -hmm. That the doorway to truth is never closed from God's side. Mm -hmm. We who constantly create these, what I call addictive untruths to keep ourselves safe. Mm -hmm. And what he draws out, I suppose, rather schematically and satirically in The Great Divorce with great brilliance, I think. Um, you know, he's a great satirist, quite apart from anything <laughs> else, what he draws out there. He then draws out in terms of a much more three-dimensional, empathic picture mm -hmm. until we have faces. So what in The Great Divorce is, for example, the, um, the tragedian mm -hmm. posturing inflating that eloquent and self-pitying ego. Um, what does that look like in, in real human terms? That's, that's a, an entertaining and rather chilling mm -hmm. parody. But how might you know, the ordinary person like you and me experience that or mm -hmm. get to that point? Well, Till We Have Faces helps you to see that, helps you to see somebody coping with their, their confusion, their sense of rejection, Mm -hmm. The deep hurts in their in their psyche, dealing with that by that kind of fiction, mm -hmm. and it's it's narrated until we have faces without a, a shred of condemnation or belittling. Mm -hmm. It's just you know, Lewis kind of sitting with this wounded psyche. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't say wounded psyche, but you know, wounded. <laughs> well, you are psyche too. He says, she said, you, you too will be psyche. Yes, yes. Um, you know, but sitting sitting with that and attending to how it unfolds, how it works. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I, I think um, it's as if the great divorce is one of the sermons you might preach on the basis of till we have faces, mm -hmm. but you only know the interiority of mm -hmm. the great divorce. I think if you've been through something like till we have faces, mm -hmm. yep, yeah, that's, that's what I so love about it. I think that um, his essay, Variation in Shakespeare and Others, of course, kind of points to Lewis's own, his own writing career mm. where, and thankfully because of Joel Heck's wonderful work of the 1200 page chronology of Lewis's life, accounting for every day, which is chronologically Lewis. And, and then to read an essay and a poem and a letter and a book all by Lewis around the same theme around the same time. And yeah, and so he's trying to explore that same theme again and again. That's right. I often say he's an apologist for the Christianity, but he's an evangelist for good reading and reading in the larger and the smaller sense of it. Exactly. And thinks that that's the way to truth. Yes. And to, to, I must see with other eyes, right? My own eyes are not enough for me. I have to have another perspective. And I read not to know that I'm not alone. I read to see where I am in the great grain of the universe. Yes. So reading is always about that blend, that polyphony of recognition and surprise. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, that's 
that's what we look forward to at the end of all mm -hmm. the the fusion of recognition and surprise mm -hmm. and our names in the lamb's book of life right exactly i hope that i have some more good chapters to write before i read my entry in that book Earlier this year, your wife Jane and I were um, gratefully, uh, at least grateful for me, um, part of a conference at Virginia Seminary about C.S. Lewis as a theologian for the third millennium. Especially with your position as a theologian um, in our age, how do you assess his role as a theologian, especially given the rise of cultural apologetics and a broader understanding of, of theology? Well, I think we've we've kind of sketched this already in, in a way, haven't we, that he he does two or three things which seem to me very crucial for any apologetic for our age. One does depend on this, this deep commitment to the idea of God's presence in the urging of our hearts towards the truth, mm -hmm. which is so hard to believe sometimes when so much around us in this post-truth environment mm -hmm. privileges lying and Mm -hmm. kind of moral laziness in mm -hmm. public life. But Lewis tells us not to despair of that. He tells us that this is you know, engraved in our hearts somewhere. That's important. Mm -hmm. And then I think that demythologizing of our own self-confected myths about technology and mm -hmm. dominance, the power of the human over the world, and a, re a reintroduction to the humble physical reality that is simply human. Mm -hmm. And when all said and done about these um, ludicrous fantasies that we have about artificial intelligence, <laughs> we're brought back down to earth. Mm -hmm. I think with the recognition that the one thing that artificial intelligence can't do is to assure us that we are really understood at a level more than verbal. Mm -hmm. When I was thinking for a lecture a few years ago about artificial intelligence, I remember trying to list some of the, the phrases that artificial intelligence couldn't quite cope with, mm -hmm. like, Daddy kiss it better, mm -hmm. or even, I had a good night's sleep, or even, I'm hungry. Mm -hmm. All the, the things which our ambitious scientific philosophy forgets the small change, the routine currency mm -hmm. of physical human exchange. Mm -hmm. And Lewis so values that. Mm -hmm. And that's why he, you know, he's a good celebrant of what in, in Britain we call the, you know, the, the bog standard mm -hmm. enjoyment of a good meal and good company. Yeah. Yeah. And that's no small thing. But it's combined there with this tremendous pushback against the mythology of technological conquest. Mm -hmm. So that's, mm -hmm. that's again, something where he's got a lot to say to us. Mm -hmm. Strictly theologically, I think one of the things he most draws out is, is exactly what you were talking about earlier, that the opposite of love isn't hate, it's pride. Mm -hmm. And helping us to see what pride is theologically, that reservation to ourselves of the right to invent the world what if what if we haven't invented the world and never could? What if mm -hmm. the job's been done? What if we have been invented by love? Mm -hmm. And our task is to respond to that. What if? Mm -hmm. So that's a, a big theological issue, I'd say. It's mm -hmm. about the doctrine of creation. It's about the doctrine of redemption, too. And it's about the theology of the human. So in all those ways, I, I find him hugely suggestive and generative for mm. thinking theologically. Mm. Well, and I think that his lack of um, specifically systematic theologizing is in some ways a great invitation. Oh, um, absolutely, yes. Rather than a, a detriment, especially in our age. Especially in our age when people will find their way into thinking theologically by, by a great diversity of roots. And you you then turn around to them. I used the analogy before, I think, like that chap in Moliere, who was told that he's been speaking prose all his life, and he never thought he'd be clever enough to talk prose. <laughs> so you <laughs> turn around and say to people, you've been talking theology. <laughs> yeah. 
And it's that physicality. I, I don't know why this image has, has been haunting me during our whole conversation, but I think now I know. I've been thinking about the anecdote recorded in one of the biographies where he's walking around Addison's Walk mm. with a friend and he sees this little clump um, on a bush and he says, by Jove, I think it's my hat. And then it comes up and it is my hat and he claps the whole sodden mess on his head and off he goes. <laughs> I remember that. Mm. And it reminds me, especially as you're talking about where Lewis is, I think that Malcolm Geith is this real ambassador between the physical and the theological. Mm -hmm. Because if you've only encountered him in his books, mm -hmm. you have to smell the man, right? And he has that the tobacco and beer and just the earthiness of him, um, yet really picking the lock of all the unseen world in his incredible physicality, which I think that has grown. And I mean, I've known him since before he was completely white haired, you know, uh, as, as have you. And the way that he kind of almost lives into the physically iconic role of poet and priest, and all, he's contradictory in exactly the right way to be an ambassador towards these things. That's right. That's right. I think that uh, he and Lewis would have gotten along quite well. Oh, yes. Next season, we'll be tackling some of the correspondence. We'll be looking at Letters to an American Lady, which was my first adult book of Lewis's. I think we'll look at Letters to Children, perhaps. Tell us just a little bit about the compellingly charming, humble, witty, and insightful uh, role. What do you make of his, his correspondence? I love reading the letters. I discovered the first volume of letters, which his brother edited. In the mm -hmm. 60s. I think when I was in the sixth form, I remember taking it out of the, the public library in Swansea and taking it out several times during 18 months. That's the one. Um, and going back to it again and again, I was, I think I was intrigued by and encouraged by the fact that here was a major literary scholar. Mm -hmm. who was inhabiting the Christian world. Here was a Christian inhabiting the literary world. And mm -hmm. at that point, when I was studying English for my um, final high school examinations, it really helped to know that there was somebody out there who was inhabiting both those worlds with equal gusto. Mm -hmm. I needed to know that could be done mm -hmm. because that's what I wanted to do. And then when, of course, the, um, the big volumes of correspondence were finally published, well, I, I go back to them constantly. I read them with huge enjoyment. And again, with that sense, you know, I've, I've read the whole lot. Mm -hmm. And I think I'd still say, yes, these are the words of a profoundly converted man. Mm -hmm. When there are explosions of irritation or um, resentment or whatever, they're almost immediately recognized, named, shelved. Mm -hmm. There's a fundamental generosity coming through. And also, of course, that really quite austere critical voice that he can turn on the writings of even his best friends. And I shudder to think, you know, if, if I'd ever sent poetry to him, <laughs> I shudder to think what would have come back, a whole list of, well, you know, that's pretty good, but actually the rest of it is rubbish. So, mm -hmm. you know, back to square one. He's, he doesn't spare people. But yeah. I think you'd you'd take it because you knew that he – well, back to where we started. He was taking him absolutely seriously. Sure, sure. And he would have said, it's rubbish in exactly this way, but here's how can you you can fix how that scans. That's right. And I think that's part of why he sends his own poetry out because it doesn't always, you know, kind of scintillate the way that, that we wish that it would. So, yeah, I find it dangerous to have those volumes open and around because I stumble across one and an hour and a half later, I begin, you know, looking for the task yes, that I yes. <laughs> <laughs> So. Oh, wonderful. What a joy to spend some time with you. Rowan Williams, thank you for coming on the show. And as the landlord rings the bell for final drinks, can you please tell us where people can find out more about you and where they can pick up a copy of The Lion's World? Well, um, The Lion's World, I think, is still in print and still available from the publishers um, and can be ordered in any good bookshop. And as for me, well, there's a not not completely accurate entry on Wikipedia. Okay. Okay, good. That's a good starting spot. Well, thanks again to the most reverend Rowan Williams for coming on the show. We've got a refer a friend bonus. More on that soon. 
We also want to extend our grateful thanks to all of our listeners, our Patreon supporters, and particularly our top tier supporters, including James, Matt1, Matt2, Jake, Erica, and Marvin, Joelle, Deborah, Amanda, and Emmy, Thomas and Bill, Joanna, Bud, and Shane, Kay and Paul, Kimberly, Gillis, Gary, Stephen, and Kelly, Chris, James, Kate, Peter, David, Angela, and Rowdy. As always, we pray for our listeners and all the prayer requests in our Slack channel every Tuesday. And if you've enjoyed this episode, please share it on social media and tell a friend about it. Thanks especially, as always, to our audio engineer, Taylor Schroll. And please join us next time, where we'll continue going further up and further in. Cheers. Cheers.